I have finally completed the latest volume of a certain magical index, GT7. And today, I'm going to tell you why this volume was so great by covering it from start to finish. Also, huge credit to JS06, the GOAT of fan translations, as without him, we wouldn't be able to read this goddamn thing yet. Of course, this video is going to have spoilers, so if you haven't read it all yet, you have been warned. Unless you want to know the juiciest spoilers fresh out of Japan, then be my guest. With the prologue, we have the Misaka sister on guard at the wall of Academy City, as Accelerator has given each of the clones jobs around the city, with a lot being involved in security after the events of Genesis Testament 3, where the numbers of anti-skill Academy City's police force have been severely depleted. Toma and company arrive along with the captured Aradia, who was defeated in the previous volume, and has her hands and feet sealed with duct tape, which stops her from using her magic, which involves creating this ointment with the sweat from her feet. Yep, if you didn't know Kamachi was an absolute degenerate, you do now. So effectively, Aradia is powerless, since she's unable to boost her stats via magic, as she did in the previous volume. Oftenus exchanges some amusing banter with the clone, which I enjoyed. But other than getting a bit of exposition regarding the clones and Accelerator, not much happened in the prologue. It definitely set up the clones having more purpose in both the plot and world of Index, after they were revealed publicly to the entire world in Genesis Testament 4, which I feel is what a lot of fans, myself included, were waiting for. And that's not the only thing that was finally addressed and developed upon in this volume, as I'll get into. Now in chapter 1, this was mostly slice of life, but we did get some really fun character interactions, and the plot still developed in a meaningful way while at it. After taking Aradia, Ophanus, and Index to his dorm, Toma realises he needs to get some food, so the group set off. Despite Aradia being quite uncomfortable, she's being forced to do what Toma says, and being reduced to a normal person without access to her magic. As it is New Year's Day in the story, they decide to head to a shrine, where we explored a new location in Academy City, that being a skyscraper in District 12, devoted to the scientific research of different mythologies and religions across the world, in which a Shinto shrine is located. I honestly find this concept really interesting, as we all know Academy City to be a place where religion doesn't really have much standing, but here they do acknowledge it, but solely for the students who decide to pursue it in further education, rather than functioning as places of worship. Under this Academy City framework, this place has no connection to the magic side, as they are all just replicas, although it does make me wonder if idol theory is possible or not using what's there, but from the text it's implied that it's not. The clones are also at the shrine, along with Misaka, Shokuho and Kuriko, and we get a cool interaction with Kuriko meeting the clones for the first time, which I did make a video about. Misaka also acknowledges that Accelerator's remorse is genuine after sending himself to jail for crimes against humanity because of the sisters project where he murdered 10,000 clones of her. But Misaka wishes that she found a way herself to integrate the sisters into society in a way they are accepted, rather than Accelerator fixing what she deems to be her responsibility. It's only a short moment, but I did like this aspect of Misaka's character. We also cut to Accelerator in prison, where he is visited by Last Order, where they share a very bittersweet moment, as Last Order wishes him a happy new year and gifts him food. Very wholesome. Meanwhile, Alistair's gang is on the move as he questions Anna Sprengel, where we finally find out the purpose of her plan from the previous volumes. RNC Occultics was Anna's method to understand how the Bridge Builders Cabal operates, which gave her valuable information before she infiltrated it. This definitely adds more method to Anna's madness, as her approach in the story so far seemed very chaotic and directionless at times, due to how she was written as a mysterious antagonist, which some fans seem to criticise because we weren't spoon-fed answers right from the start. It's almost as if Kamachi likes to write mystery-based stories. Back at the shrine, Terma notes that the wishes of the students seem quite negative, which oftenest refers to as Kotatsu Syndrome, likely as a consequence of the recent events of GT, or maybe because of the Transcendence, since they have the power to influence collective groups. Alice, however, suddenly appears before Terma, 
as chapter one ends. We also get an anecdote in the between the line sections at the end of each chapter, telling the story of a young girl who becomes a transcendent, whose identity was a mystery until the epilogue, where we learn it was in fact Anna Sprengel. We cut back to Accelerator in Chapter 2, who is informed the Bridge Builders Cabal have formed a consulate in Academy City. For those of you who don't know what that is, it's basically like an embassy, but lacks the authority to stage negotiations between them and the host country. Meaning Transcendents can walk around free and come and go as they please in Academy City, with no repercussions or limits with their own base located in the city. This was all done without Accelerator's knowledge, as the consulate was approved in the Japanese government. Although it is kind of weird how Japan's government is approving laws and shit for Academy City when they are technically independent from one another. But I guess Academy City would have representation in a Japanese diet. And no, not the food diet. Archbishop of the Anglican Church Dion Fortune then calls Accelerator and warns him not to deport or take action against the consulate, as the retaliation from the United Nations and other countries in the world will likely doom Academy City. However, Dion states she would actually want Academy City out of the picture, but not the Transcendents to do it, as she knows the Bridge Builders Cabal would be at the top of the food chain in a magic-dominated world which would be detrimental to not only the Anglican Church, but the other established churches in Europe. I think it's quite easy to forget that Dion and the Magic side as a whole don't like Academy City's existence, as they have always been the polar opposite of them. And in a world of new leadership and after a world war, Dion is prioritizing the interests of the Anglican Church and the Magic side as a whole. But Dion still has her personal attachments to Hermazara and Takitsubo due to what happened in the Koronzon arc. But Hamazara has always been sort of a rebel in Academy City, and this remains true in GT, where he was hunted down by anti-skill, meaning he doesn't represent Academy City as an entity. Therefore, Dion being pro Hamazara, but anti-Academy City, is still consistent to her character. Meanwhile, Terma goes back to his dorm, but Alice appears once again and convinces him and the gang to come to her new headquarters, also located in District 12, which is modeled after the Queen of Hearts' palace in the story of Alice in Wonderland. And I honestly thought Terma was gonna get Isekai to Wonderland in this volume, Thank God I'm wrong, because every light novel doesn't need to be an isekai nowadays. Terma is introduced to two more members of the Bridge Builders Cabal, H.T. Trismegistus, who acts as Alice's butler and personal simp, and Moot Thebes, the supposed punishment specialist of the Transcendents. Alice also freaks out after Terma blurted out that the Cabal was split in two of those who believed Terma was a threat and must be killed and those who want him alive the killers and the rescuers. Her ominous reaction also acts as foreshadowing for the events later on. The Bridge Builders Cabal has also been developing spiritual items known as shrink drinks, basically giant syringes that have been designed specifically to kill transcendents. But why did the Bridge Builders Cabal want to kill their own kind? Because they have come to Academy City to hunt down Anna Sprengel, who do you want to kill for being a traitor? while also having no idea she was defeated and turned into a film can by Alistair and Anna Kingsford. We also caught Yomikawa interrogating Tesso, who is also in jail because of when she went crazy in Genesis Testament 5. And Tesso believes Komakawa Seria wasn't planning to go to the Miyashita arc herself in the previous volume, but she may have been leading someone there in order to obtain something valuable. This pretty much implies that Kamakawa and the director of Academy City she's linked with, Kaizumi Sugutoshi, are likely in contact with Alistair and guided him there to find the Wandering Treasure Keepers and Anna Kingsford's body. Or at least that's what I think they were implying. If true, it's interesting that Kamakawa is still loyal to Alistair rather than Accelerator, and I'd like to see if Kamakawa will join up with Alistair or get interrogated as a spy. It is also revealed that most of the Transcendents appear to have a link with Alistair, but he's still trying to figure out the mystery behind them. With Chapter 3, Terma goes around the Bridge Builders Cabal headquarters and meets up with the Bologna Sucker Bus, who seems to have made a full recovery from her injuries in the previous volume, as she's now happy playing video games in her room. This is where Terma learns the Transcendents each have a set of conditions they abide by, in which if you meet those conditions, they will save you or be on your side. 
If not, then they won't care what happens to you. Trimegistus also explains they are not like the magic gods, as they have no desire to be worshipped and don't want anyone to know who or what they are. Which also explains why the Transcendents have been unknown up until this point in the story. The fact they wanted to remain secret was put into jeopardy by Anna Sprengel. Meanwhile, Toma learns that all the Transcendents pretty much want her dead, which in typical Toma fashion goes against what he believes. But it is also noted that Toma already defeated Anna Sprengel and was unable to break her illusions, prompting her to change, meaning that Anna would likely continue on and on if Toma kept stopping her, as no matter how many times she's put into jail, she'll just escape anyway. Toma doesn't even have a reason to save her, cause you know, she's been a dick. Not just to him, but the entire world. But at the same time, he's utterly convinced that killing her isn't the answer to the situation. But if she does keep escaping and doesn't learn her lesson, she's just gonna cause more chaos in the world and make everyone's lives a misery as she has done up until this point. This moral dilemma to let Anna Sprengel die or to save her is the most interesting theme of the entire volume due to the beliefs of Thomas in contrast to the Transcendence. Alice herself has the logic of a child and acts on a whim in most situations. The fact that functioning adults with individual moral codes are all afraid of her judgment just shows you how desperate they are in order to achieve their dreams. Terma notes they might be trying to influence Alice or want to influence her to try and get rid of those they don't like. And Toma believes that this is wrong as he doesn't want Alice to be influenced in this way that a childlike person like herself is going to kill someone just for the hell of it. But on the flip side, a lot of the transcendents think Toma is the one who is influencing Alice, which has caused a lot of problems for them and the Cabal. And I find this power dynamic really engaging as Alice is so powerful that she can do whatever she wants and yet she's limited by her childlike brain. Meaning the people around her are so afraid of her and yet are doing their very best to influence her to do what they want. Ophanus also meets with Aradia and convinces her that Toma does meet her conditions for saving him by basically conning her into thinking Toma is in fact a witch. Ophanus was really big brained in this moment and definitely her highlight of the volume. Aradia seemed to be the one who is most conflicted about killing Anna, but thanks to Ophanus and Toma, she decides to side with the point of view saying that killing her would change the fundamental nature of the Cabal and the creation of the shrink drink has been too hasty and a huge risk as they built the tools engineered for their own destruction. Trimegistus seems to operate under the conditions of what he believes is common sense and thinks that Aradia is acting on a whim to help a traitor, making her an enemy and keeping Aradia in the Cabal runs the risk of her losing again and that she may be planning to use Alice for herself along with Toma. Trimegistus then strikes Aradia down in front of Toma and he believes that Toma should be eliminated as well since he is the one who can control Alice by himself. Trimegistus believes he is doing the world a favour by killing Toma, who is also influencing the other members of the Cabal in his eyes. I like that no one in the Bridge Builders Cabal is truly evil. Each have complex moral codes in the form of their conditions, where they believe what they are doing is the right thing. They then fight, but Toma is mostly just running away because he feels completely overpowered against Trimegistus, with him using a sword attack which is very hard to predict. Although it seems that Toma invoked a supposed lost memory, which helped him dodge it, possibly referencing his fight with Kanzaki. It's interesting to see if any more lost memories might surface in the future. Toma does later dodge a strike from Trimegistus using his own willpower, despite it moving faster than he can react, as even time is distorted with each strike. Trimegistus is also able to adjust his own parameters by changing his name to use the magic of different gods as he channels his full power off the bat to beat Toma. And yep, Toma dies once more, but he is revived by good old Mary, whose conditions compel her to protect Toma from Trimegistus, as good old Mary basically wants to give miracles to those less fortunate, making Toma the perfect candidate for her condition due to his notorious bad luck. Mary then fights Trimegistus, who she refers to 
to as random letters, basically mocking his name as she displays her other magical abilities, with also the apparent tools able to create a universe. The fight, however, is put to a halt, as Alice punishes random letters for killing Toma, and Mary for failing to protect him, as she one-shots both at once, because Alice is that strong. But I have a feeling that they are still alive. Toma then stands up to Alice, so she summons a griffin, which beats the shit out of Toma, carrying him in its beak and smacking him all over the place. The Misaka sisters are on standby as Accelerator orders Academy City to intervene as the sisters fire an anti-aircraft gun at the Griffin, which causes it to drop Toma. Accelerator had actually paid off the Japanese government to move the consulate to a different district, which gave him the opportunity to intervene at this moment, with Toma at the mercy of Alice. Toma is pushed to the limits with his injuries, and he doesn't want to get others involved as the Griffin bites his arm, but the power within expands and kills the Griffin from the inside. Now that's metal. Does this mean Toma is gaining more control over the powers within after the events of the end of New Testament? Toma then shouts at Alice and tells her to fight him, but a childlike insecurity makes Alice stop fighting as she feels concerned by Toma and Academy City, proving indeed Toma is the one with the power to influence Alice. In the epilogue, Alistair's group arrives as Aradia spies on them unnoticed, and then Alistair believes the transcendents all seem to be linked to the power of the secret chiefs, or holy guardian angels. Aradia is discovered, but Toma appears out of nowhere and takes the film can of Anna Sprengel, turning her back to normal with a magic breaker as him, Aradia, and Alice successfully escape. Toma then forms a new alliance with Anna Sprengel, who is confused why Toma is helping her, but he also frees Aradia of the duct tape, meaning she can use magic once more. Surrounded by enemies on every side by his actions, Anna Sprengel believes more transcendents will come to Academy City and prepares to use her trump card, I was. Never did I expect that Toma would be on the same side as Anna and I was, but here we are, the hype is real. But how did Alistair or Kingsford not even react to Toma when they could have easily stopped him? Well, Alistair reveals that he just wanted to save Toma by intervening at several points in Genesis Testament. So he was simply frozen and confused when Toma showed up and basically undone all of Alistair's efforts to seal Anna Sprengel away so that he could at least protect Toma from her. This is a really heartfelt moment as Alistair's feelings towards Toma have definitely changed a lot since the start of the story. He's no longer just a valued toy to him anymore. He genuinely cares about him. But the fact Alistair can't become a hero like he wanted to makes him cry. It harkens back to Iwaz's speech to him in Old Testament 19, saying that the three heroes have qualities Alistair wishes he had. Alistair is ultimately doomed to a life of failure, and that likely will never change. Anna Kingsford then embraces Alistair as one of her children, as Genesis Testament 7 ends. The ending of GT7 truly was a highlight, as we saw Alistair develop further as a character. It's honestly refreshing to see Alistair in the forefront so often from what we've been used to in the past, and I honestly can't wait to see what direction he will go. But Aeon, he's not a villain anymore like you said. He's not going to destroy magic anymore. Well, we'll have to wait and see, but ultimately, I think Alistair will never be a hero like Toma, and I think that's the entire point of the ending. So I can see Alistair maybe trying to get rid of the curse. Whether that involves destroying the phases, we will have to wait and see, but no doubt we can expect a free faction war between the Transcendents, Alistair's group, and Toma's group and I cannot wait to see it. While this volume wasn't the most action-packed volume of Index by any stretch, it did have some really exciting moments in the final chapter, but that wasn't the point of this volume. It presented interesting moral dynamics that we learnt more about the function of the Bridge Builders Cabal and their contrast with Toma regarding the dilemma of Anna Sprengel. Is it morally right to kill Anna? Is Toma completely naive for saving her without a reason for it, convincing himself that he will find one later on? I can seriously see this decision backfiring on Toma super hard, as Anna Sprengel isn't the most trustworthy character in the world by any stretch. So this decision could cause some interesting character development for Toma and some serious repercussions in the foreseeable future.
I loved the world building and lore this volume presented, and I wasn't bored at all while reading it, despite having a decent amount of exposition. Kamachi integrates it well in the story with the dialogue of the characters. While a lot of answers regarding the plot have been revealed, there's still plenty of mysteries revolving Alice and Anna Sprengel that definitely keeps me curious. It just goes to show that Index is a series where there is a lot of build-up, where you gotta be patient. Despite having a shit ton of build-up volumes in the past, I honestly find it bizarre that some critics of the early GT volumes were quick to bandwagon on it, thinking GT was gonna suck. If anything, it looks more promising than ever. I haven't been this excited for the next Index volume since like New Testament 18 or New Testament 22 or 21. The future looks truly bright. I'm going to be doing a live full discussion of the volume with Malcolm on the channel, so check that out if you want to hear our thoughts and analysis. Anyway, I'm going to rate Genesis Testament 7 a 9 out of 10, and I'll see you all next time. Bye-bye.